Eastward, westward, where to next? Will this man be the master of your destiny? Adolf Hitler was born 51 years ago in Austria. Near the German frontier. He is still very young when his father died. In early life, he is sickly. But by the time he goes to school, he's sturdy enough. Just like any other schoolboy. Who could imagine that young Adolf at seven would have developed into this 25 years later? At the age of 19, without waiting to get his diploma, he leaves school and takes the entrance examination for the Academy of Painting in Vienna. He failed. He returns home to find his mother seriously ill. Death soon takes her. Adolf Hitler is left alone, friendless and without means. At the age of 20, he finds himself among the pitiful army of the unemployed. He tries his hand at art again. He paints watercolors, which friends try to sell for him in the cafes of Vienna. Not successfully. So he takes copies of old masters. And forges names to them. Yet for all this, he earns only enough to keep himself from salvation and to find a bed at night in the Doss houses of Vienna. He's 25 years old, this Austrian. When Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany decrees the war of 1914, the Kaiser promises, I shall lead you to an era of wonders. Wonders indeed. Germany invents new war horrors. First use of poison gas. Frightfulness, they called it then. Flammenwerfer by the Germans. Germany invents air raids, a nightmare legacy for all mankind. The Lusitania, 1,200 men, women, and children drowned. Spurlos versunken sinking without trace. Another German invention. Hitler had dreamed of military glory, but again he must resign himself to obscurity. Along with Germany, his country is defeated, is ruined, and he himself, after four bitter years of warfare, has gained nothing but a corporal's strife. One other thing. You see, for the first time, the moustache, which was later to become... And later still, Hitler is 30 years old and a failure. So he must have remained. But the ex-Kaiser's era of wonders has turned out to be an age of grinding poverty and chaos. And it is this situation that gives Adolf Hitler his chance at last. To avoid their just payments, appropriate punishment for their crime against humanity in 1914, the Germans resort to inflation. Money melts like snow. In 1920, the dollar is worth about 10 marks. In 1921, 100 marks. In 1922, 1,000 marks. In the spring of 1923, 100,000 marks. And in the same year, millions and millions of marks, until we reach the astronomical figure of 4 billion marks to the dollar. Inflation cheats the Allies, but it also brings ruin to Germany. The moral fiber of the whole nation is sapped. Evil soil, but fertile soil. For the coming sowing of the seeds of Nazis. Hitler has by now become a secret agent. In other words, a spy. In the service of the Reichswehr. Hitler has been entrusted with the task of watching the activities of a new political party, the German Workers' Party in Munich. And while still in the pay of the army, he first joins and then takes the leadership of a very organization he was paid to spy upon. He changes the title to the National Socialist German Workers' Party which is speedily contracted to that word of dire meaning, Nazi. In 1923, the wretchedness and discontent of the people are at their worst. It is on November the 9th that Hitler and his associates, including the famous General Ludendorff, decide that the moment has come for them to make a bid for power. They are so sure of success that they draw up in advance the proclamation that their provisional government will make to the people after their coup d'etat. But the coup d'etat fails. The Nazi ranks waver and break. On the eve of the rising, Hitler had sworn to do or die. I have bullets in my revolver for my comrades, and one for myself, if we fail, he declared. It was just a promise. First of so many. But he did not kill himself. 
He ran away. But he is caught and put on trial. The sentence is five years imprisonment in the fortress of Landsberg. But his treatment is by no means severe, and he uses this enforced leisure to write his now famous Mein Kampf, Germany's Book of Doom. Outside the prison walls, the situation continues to cause alarm. It is feared the communist propaganda will ultimately triumph. Those who had supported Hitler before, captains of industry, financiers, generals, unite to obtain his freedom. It isn't Hitler they are concerned about. They want to create a diversion against the menace of the Red Wave. He is released from prison to find that his backers are readier than ever to give him help. Leaflets, pamphlets, books, an avalanche of words and promises. The German loves the uniform. So Hitler gives out uniforms. Uniforms for everybody. Uniforms for boys. Uniforms for girls. For journalists, for motorists, workmen. Whole factories are made over to manufacturing Nazi uniforms. Newspapers are required to spread the doctrine. Nazi cigarettes are introduced with pictures of the leaders on the cards. And the factories where the cigarettes are made belong to the party. The sales of cigarettes, uniforms, arms, insignia, flags, bring in over 70 million marks a year. All profits for the party. The Nazi party. Like a quack selling a panacea at a fair, Hitler makes the Germans believe that the Nazi policy is a cure for all their ills. He promises everything to everybody. And all the time, the big parades go on. Bigger, but always bigger. So that the people in their wretchedness, hungry and unemployed, swarm in their thousands into the Nazi organization. The brown shirts become an army, the private army of a single man. A man who aspires to become dictator of Germany. Dictator of Europe itself. But many serious Germans still hold him suspect. The problem is solved in one stroke, the Reichstag. Germany's parliament building catches fire on the night of February the 27th, 1933. A few days before the so-called elections, which were to confirm or otherwise Hitler's accession to the chancellorship. The communists are proclaimed the culprits. Hitler and his men declared it was meant to be a signal for a Bolshevist revolution. It was, of course, necessary to produce the actual perpetrators of the fire. So a young Dutch halfwit named Marinus van der Luba, found by the police in the burning ruins, although there were no witnesses to his arrest except the police, is made the chief incendiary and put on trial. Van der Luba is condemned to be beheaded. The others, except Togler, are set free. So Hitler is confirmed as chancellor. He announces his policy. To the workmen, more wages. The employers, no strikes. To the small shopkeepers, Legislation against the big stores. To mothers and children, protection against child labor. Promises. Promises that would have placed a whole nation in chains of slavery. The parade maddened public acclaim him. Ovation succeeds ovation, but his megalomania is still not satisfied. One obstacle yet remains in the way of his ambition. Hindenburg is president of the Republic, and it must not be forgotten that Germany is a Republic. The old marshal is a legendary figure of the Great War a national hero, a national idol still, and behind him is the German army. As yet untouched by the taint of Nazism. But Hindenburg is old, very old, and Hitler knows he cannot live much longer, so he decides to become president too, and thus sole ruler of Germany. Then to remilitarize the nation on a scale never before known to mankind. First, however, he must deal with trouble in his own ranks. He hears of plotting. Hindenburg named General von Schleicher as his successor. Hindenburg has no love for Hitler. He despises him as a gas man. General von Schleicher and Captain Ernst Röhm, swashbuckler and perverts, join together in a strange alliance to overthrow Hitler. Hitler acts, as always, instantly and without mercy. General Göring is given the task of cleaning up Berlin. <laughs> Hitler is now master of the situation. And within only a few weeks, Hindenburg has the good grace not to exhaust his rival's patience. He takes leave of life on the 2nd of August, and prolonged obsequies are ordained, culminating in the funeral at Tannenberg. The German papers that announced the president's death at the same time published the text of a law adopted the day before. While Hindenburg was still living, decreeing Hitler 
President and Chancellor. The same day, German troops are compelled to take a strange new oath. An oath of fidelity to Hitler personally. I swear by God this sacred oath that I will render unconditional obedience to the leader of the German Reich and people, Adolf Hitler, the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, and that I will, as a valiant soldier, at all times be ready to stake my life for this oath. And while the German people mourn the passing of the great marshal, the Austrian upstart secured himself finally in position as head of the German state. All that remains is the election. To confirm his succession, the people must decide. Foregone conclusion, under the mass attack of Goebbels' hysterical propaganda, Hitler is duly confirmed. More acclamations. More ovations. But the public expects more than this. They want the fulfillment of all those pledges. Hitler cannot deliver. But he can and does dope his dupes with growing doses of anti-Semitism. He puts into effect his theory of racism, according to which only the 100% Aryan is worthy of living and propagating his kind in Germany. How different from the ideal are the leaders themselves. Hitler, thinking far ahead, sets out to capture the youth of Germany. But Hitler, who has made racism the foundation of National Socialism, cannot be sure that he himself is a true Aryan. His father was the natural son of a young woman named Schickelgruber. And he nearly came to bear that name himself. Could he have become the master of Germany if that had been the case? Instead of Heil Hitler, imagine the Nazi salute, accompanied by the ridiculous chant, Heil Schickelgruber. But as it happened, an old man, Johann George Hitler, at the age of 84, acknowledged as his son, Adolf Hitler's father. The illegitimate Alois Schickelgruber, at that time 39 years old. Was old Johann George Hitler really the man to whom Maria Anna Schickelgruber, the farm girl, had surrendered 40 years previously? Famous men, if they are Jews, are forced to flee their country. Three Nobel Prize winners. Einstein, James Frank, Freud, all have to go. And should the fever show signs of abating, it can readily be whipped up again. Shops are branded and then broken into. Wrecked. Plunder. Any attempt at resistance is a signal for a beating. A collective fine is imposed on all the Jews in Germany. A total sum running to millions of marks. The wealth thus confiscated is used to help meet the cost of Germany's colossal rearmament. Not all the money is used in this way. Some goes to line the pockets of Nazi leaders. sidelight on his complex character, guarded by his boy stormtroopers. He stands alone against this impressive background, face to face with the gigantic idol he has made of himself. If Hitler knows nothing of the sentiment common to mankind, it is because a single passion, all-absorbing, dominates him. He wants to be not only the greatest, the most powerful, the only master, even above God, whom he does not recognize, unless the clergy submits to his will. We do not want any other God but Germany itself, cries Hitler. Goebbels echoes, God manifested himself, not in Jesus Christ, but in Adolf Hitler. Christ is a false prophet, for he was a Jew, and Judaism is the source of all woes. All kinds of books are broadcast expounding the Nazi theory. Bolshevism, the fruit of Christianity, the fall of the gods. The Pope wants war. Catholic priests and Protestant clergymen 
including the martyred Niemöller, are attacked or imprisoned when they resist the imposition of the Nazi theory upon their religion. Greater than the cross in Germany is the hooked cross. Hitler's power, symbolized by this cross, must be imposed everywhere, on everyone. And it even descends this cult of Hitler from a certain grandeur to the completely ridiculous. Heil Hitler! Heil Hitler! Heil Hitler! Heil Hitler! Heil Hitler. And so the people hail, and they fly the flags. Obedience and, and discipline. Sie gehen jeder Mann zu Vertreter und zu schützen, um so mitzuhelfen am Aufbau eines wirklichen und besseren Friedens. So war uns Gott helfe. Grüßt eine Führung und Befreier. Sieg! 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 But for all the well-orchestrated evasions, Hitler knows that he's not silenced all consciences. There are still those who would like to reach behind this living wall of machine-made enthusiasm. The only news that they get in their newspapers is Nazi news is forbidden to listen in to foreign radio. The Nazis try to create a Germany of just one opinion, one point of view. The human mind in quarantine. Punishment for listening in to foreign countries is severe. In the final resort, the penalty is death. German newspapers themselves have announced sentences for this crime of penal servitude ranging from three and a half to five years. The crime of wanting to hear the truth. But the people do listen, and ingenious tricks are resorted to. Marbury, with Hitler now apparently assuming the role of a Nazi Nero. He maintains his torrent of oratory. That he and the 29 the reflex of Holland, shall not be faulted for his future. And we, when forgänglich, our Deutschland will be staying. We will not be our Deutschland will live. Yes, or no. An orgy of ringing declarations. The German people have no thought of invading any country. The German government, like the German people, are filled with the unconditional wish to make the greatest possible contribution to the preservation of peace in this world. Hamburg, August 1934. Ten months later, Germany announced conscription. We want to be a peace-loving element among the nation. We cannot repeat that often enough. The first and best principle in our government's program is that we shall not lie. When have the German people ever broken their word? This is the man who solemnly promised to respect the Versailles Treaty and the Locarno Pact. On March the 7th, 1936, German troops occupied the demilitarized zone of the Rhineland in violation of those treaties. May 1935. Germany neither intends nor wishes to interfere in the international affairs of Austria, to annex Austria, or to conclude an Anschluss. Five months later, the Germans instigate riots in Vienna. And on July the 25th, they decide upon the murder of Chancellor Dolphus, who opposes the Anschluss. The Nazis masquerade in the uniforms of the regular Austrian army, seize the broadcasting station, and announce falsely that the Dolphus ministry has resigned and that Brintelin, a pro-Hitler Austrian minister, has taken his place. Meantime, other Nazis have invaded the Chancellor shot down Dolphus. He is carried into an office and placed on a settee. And for nearly four hours, he lies bleeding to death, deprived of any help whatsoever. Dolphus dies without yield. The Nazi attempt fails. Austria remains Austria. For the time being, 
An immense throng attends the state funeral of the little chancellor. And Cardinal Initza, Archbishop of Vienna, declares... He endured the death throes of our Lord, surrounded by enemies. The pace of events intensifies. After the Austrian, the Sudetenland crisis. War seems inevitable. The Pact of Munich establishes a new agreement. Hitler guarantees formally and solemnly Czechoslovakia's new frontiers. Czechoslovakia, faithful to her undertaking, relinquishes the Sudetenland territory to the troops of the Reich. The world breathes with relief. And on the 26th of September, 1938, Hitler says of the Sudetenland, This territorial claim is the last I have to make in Europe. I have assured Mr. Chamberlain, and I repeat now, that when the Sudeten problem is settled, Germany will not raise any more territorial questions in Europe. Here are the words from the Führer's very mouth. Within six months, the promise is broken. Czechoslovakia ceases to exist. And German troops enter Prague. In the same month, the ogre of Berlin swallows the mere morsel of memo, the Lithuanian port. Great Britain decides upon conscription, and Hitler is solemnly warned that any further act of aggression means war. are running out, and August 1939 brings the most cynical stroke of all. Four years before, Hitler had declared, between Germany and Russia, there is a gulf that can never be bridged. But von Ribbentrop arrives in Moscow to sign a non-aggression pact between Hitler and Stalin. The astonishment aroused throughout the world is soon tinged with irony. So paradoxical is this new friendship between the two dictators. Current cartoons hit off the situation. I've changed my emblem a little just to please you. There's nothing new under the sun. Hitler and Stalin disguised as Frederick II and Catherine the Great. Germany is no less astonished than the rest of the world. Especially the older people who are unable to understand such a fantastic somersault. But Hitler has always concentrated on youth. The young people are his. Caught up in their earliest years, in the great Nazi machine. They think as Hitler wishes them to think. They will do only what Hitler wishes them to do. What, what a, a crime. crime. And now the final and greatest crime of all. Poland invaded. Open towns bombed. Over 350 ships mined, torpedoed, or bombed to the depths. Half of them innocent neutrals. Finland. Denmark, Norway, no people, however remote, are safe. Luxembourg, Holland, Belgium. Security vanishes from Europe. And still another crime. France, too, is laid in ruins and devoured by the war dogs of Europe. Why did Hess fly to the British Isles? Although it has not been officially admitted, the world now has reasons to believe that Hess came with a peace offer. Stop the war and join the Nazis in a joint war against the Soviet Union.
Hitler faced another winter of war and starvation. Grab the Ukrainian wheat. Grab Baku's oil and other materials of war. Attack Russia was the order. Another pledge broken. Another Hitler crime. The swastika of the Nazi party. It is gone today, blasted from the earth, but the memory of its evil genius remains. Great is man's devastation of his own handiwork. Some men's thirst for conquest is unquenchable. Names like Genghis Khan and Attila the Hun freeze the blood of men and strike terror into their hearts. Such a name was Adolf Hitler. What kind of man was this strutting, shouting fanatic of the Third Reich? If anyone really knew Adolf Hitler, surely it was his own family. Here is Adolf Hitler's sister today. Her name is Paula Wolf. Let her speak. I quote her. When we children played together, my brother Adolf was always the leader. All the others did what he told them to do. They must have had an instinct that his will was stronger than theirs. Father wanted Adolf to become a government official as he was himself, but my brother could not make up his mind. He wasn't the type to sit all the time, and therefore, as a government official, he would not feel at home. Hitler, a faceless nobody, a failure in early life who rose from the depths of a defeated and despairing Germany after World War I and fell at Armageddon years later amid the terrible wreckage of his own creation, the Third Reich. To historians, Hitler's success with the German masses stemmed from his gift of oratory, from his speeches, which had something of Wagnerian music, a foggy conglomeration of gods and heroes and blood and race. The tale of his boyhood in Kaiser Wilhelm's Germany is soon told. In the city's streets, among the crowd, the camera's eye seeks in vain for the son of a petty customs official. Proud, apart, almost friendless, he dreams of being a poet, an architect, an artist. But he winds up as a house painter and sometime common laborer. Through his twenties, the world knew nothing of him. Nineteen fourteen. The Great War rescues him from failure, a time for heroic deeds. A new symbol, the swastika, rises from black German defeat. Members sign up for the German Workers' Party. The symbol appeals to Adolf Hitler. As a corporal, he had been wounded and gassed in the war, and he soon leads the bitter veterans in the dark days that follow. The parades are an integral part of this new political force soon to become the Nationalist, Socialist, or Nazi Party. It is now 1920, and Hitler talks himself into the leadership of the party. 1923, Hitler and General Ludendorff lead the abortive beer hall riots in Munich. Hitler goes to prison, and the fanatic Dr. Goebbels takes over the party. From headquarters in Munich, Goebbels screams, we build the Third Reich on propaganda. While the parades go on, Hitler sits in Landsberg prison and writes Mein Kampf, the Bible of the Nazi movement, the answer to unemployment, red lines, depression, fight, fight. Julius Schaub, an early follower of Hitler and a fellow prisoner during Germany's days of desperation, talks now. I quote, while we were prisoners together at Landsberg, Adolf Hitler spent the mornings working on his book, Mein Kampf. In the evening after supper, when we came together, he used to read us several chapters from his book. There were discussions. The main participants in these discussions were Hess, Grebel, and Dr. Weber. For us young people, it was a training school, if I may say so, because at that time we hadn't realized just what Adolf Hitler was planning to do. 
Out of prison and now a hero, a happy Hitler resumes control of the party. The fascist salute borrowed from Mussolini becomes part of the ritual, along with the banners and the rallies. Other close ties with the Italian fascists are built. Hitler and Rudolf Hess greet Mussolini in Munich, perhaps seeking to learn the way to seize power. The anti-Semite fanatic Julius Stryker is there, and the groundwork is laid for cooperation between the fascists and the Nazis before Mussolini returned to Rome. Behind the pattern of demonstrations, parades, inflammatory speeches and rituals lies a diabolical purpose. Hitler says in Mein Kampf, man is a fighting animal. A nation, being a community of fighters, is a fighting unit. Any living organism which ceases to fight is doomed to destruction. The present government is weak. Therefore, true Germans must fight this government, conceived in shame and perpetuated in weakness. In speech after speech, Hitler screams his dogma at the German people. Nazi meetings begin to look more like military maneuvers than political rallies. 1928. Hitler has 12 seats on the German Reichstag. By 1930, the World Depression is strangling Germany. Hitler now has an ally. Rioting and disorders play into the hands of the Nazis. And by 1932, they hold 230 seats. Violence and intimidation become part of the pattern. Their newspapers, filled with inflammatory propaganda, carry the message. 1932, Hindenburg defeats Hitler for the presidency by a slim margin. The beginning of the end for him. January 30th, 1933, Hindenburg is through. Hitler is named chancellor, and in a torchlight parade, his followers pay pagan homage to the undisputed master of Germany. The Stahlhelm wore steel hats, the SS elite guards and the SA stormtroopers are all there, and they will spread terror throughout the land. Hitler now has the support of the big German cartels. Hitler is now able to put into practice his thesis, as spelled out in Mein Kampf, that the aim of all education and all effort is to produce a German who can become a soldier. The Nazi party can now start organized persecution of those Hitler has declared enemies of the state. Attention, Jews, the sign reads. The Nazi party's chosen goons will carry out their orders with a will. They swoop down on their victims. Homes are broken into day and night. Hitler says in Mein Kampf, only the application of brute force used continuously and ruthlessly can bring about a decision in favor of the side it supports. Early in 1933, all meetings of the Communist Party are forbidden in Germany. After the Reichstag fire, 4,000 are arrested and hurled into concentration camps behind barbed wire fences. Brown shirts and black shirts join in these roundups. Up to the time of Hitler's appointment as chancellor, control of the Prussian police has rested in the hands of the president. Now that is ended. The Prussian police are commanded by Hermann Goering, whose beer barrel shape contrasts with the lean, hard bodies of the men under his command. not to reason why or to question the will of the Fuhrer. August 2nd, 1934, President von Hindenburg, the idol of the German people, dies. Hitler digs in, assuming the presidency and consolidating the office with that of Chancellor. He prods the German people toward his goal at an ever-quickening pace. The Nazi party consolidates its strength and follows its blueprint to dominate the entire country. Hitler begins to acquire the glassy stare of the self-convinced messiah and has already become a total dictator. Several months earlier, he told a dismayed Reichstag the details of his first bloodbath. Minister President Hermann Goering, Hitler says, has been the avenging angel of Führer. Kurt von Schleicher and his wife have been shot dead. Captain Ernest Röhm, once Hitler's companion, is gone. Cries out Hitler, if anyone reproaches me and asks why I did not resort to the regular courts of justice, then I say this. In this hour, I was responsible for the fate of the German people. A 
large standing army is forbidden by the Versailles Treaty. But for a long time, the Nazis have managed to circumvent this. Since 1925, they have had an organization known as the Reichswehr under Baldur von Schirach, the youth organizer. There is a cadet corps and a phony labor corps. Every village, every town, every city adds to the roster of young men trained to serve as soldiers of the Reich. These labor battalions are pledged to serve Hitler in these words. Never in the trenches, never surrounded by bursting bombs, but we are soldiers of the Reich. At first, these men drill with shovels, and Germany has more hunting clubs than game, a cover for other military organizations. Gradually, the world begins to see through this massive subterfuge. Von der Saar. Ein Volk, ein Führer, ein Reich, ein Land. Increasingly bolder with each passing day, the conspirators against world peace soon are strong enough to forget the false labor battalions and the phony shovels. Armed with real guns and striding along in new uniforms, they are a finished fighting force. Cavalry, another violation of the Versailles Treaty, whose framers remembered the feared Uhlans, passes in review before the Reichsführer. Panzer cars begin to appear. As time passes, the goal, world conquest, seems closer. Hitler begins to feel that he is as ready as he ever will be. March 7th, 1936, he announces his troops will reoccupy the demilitarized Rhineland. The troops march west, 35,000 strong. Don't worry, Hitler tells the Allies, this is only symbolic. Nevertheless, world capitals are jittery. Paris considers mobilization, but nothing happens. Britain is too preoccupied with her economic problems. Hitler's bold revival of German militarism, the reappearance of the German eagle, the dedication of the Nazi party, all these signs fail to arouse action. America, with prosperity returned, is indifferent. By 1938, Hitler has an air force of 1,500 first-class fighters, tanks and panzer cars for his slick motorized division, and three and a half million trained soldiers. March 11th, 1938, De Führer makes his first move across traditional German borders. He invades Austria, and within two days, a puppet Austrian chancellor proclaims the unification of the two countries. Another diplomatic card in Hitler's hand, the revived German Navy, a nightmare to Britain with her exposed sea lanes. She, France, and Italy sign the infamous Munich Pact. September 1938. By the following March, Hitler gobbles up the remainder of a prostrate Czechoslovakia. The great Skoda munitions works is added to the Nazi arsenal. More weapons for Deführer's conquests. The Munich Pact becomes a symbol of appeasement, and the world wonders where the next strike will be. And now, Russia begins to show an active concern. No bridegroom could be happier than Adolf Hitler, who is keeping his rendezvous with destiny. In six short years since he became chancellor, the German eagle again has the world trembling. Facing France, the Siegfried defense line bristles with tank traps and guns. But Hitler's move will not be there, but to the east. Yes, Poland is the next target. As Germany and Italy sign a military pact, the German divisions are sent to the Polish border and begin maneuvers. The world, hoping for Russian intervention, is shocked when Hitler and Stalin sign a friendship pact. It is not long before the maneuvers are recognized by the world for what they are, preparation for another Hitler invasion. To 
the Polish border, Hitler has sent divisions of cavalry to cope with the Polish mud when it becomes too difficult for the mechanized divisions. Everything goes according to plan. Out of the youth groups have come divisions of hardened soldiers ready to die for the fatherland. Out of the young groups of athletes who practice jumping come the tough paratroopers ready to strike with lightning speed. From the glider clubs, supposedly sports clubs, come the trained pilots to man the Messerschmitts. And out of the merchant marine come the trained submarine crews, ready to man the Atlantic wolf packs with which the world is ill-prepared to deal. Yes, the youth groups are serving their purpose in the Nazi master plan. September 1st, 1939. Germany's radio stations crackle out the warnings, stand by, something big. Inside one heavily guarded studio, the Minister of Propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, speaks. The news is world shaking. Germany has invaded Poland. Within two days, France and Britain have in turn declared war upon Germany. From the balcony of the Reich Chancellery, Adolf Hitler speaks to the people, let us do duty. He is shocked and furious that the Allies have come to the aid of Poland. There is fighting in the streets of Danzig, desperate fighting all over Poland. literally burned off the maps of the world as the Panzer divisions execute the first of the ferocious Blitzkrieg. The German-Polish frontier disappears as the Poles try to oppose a moving 20-mile wall of steel and firepower with their ancient cavalry. Hitler goes to the front to view the slaughter at Poznan. In three weeks, the nation is reduced to unresisting ashes. and France had decided to come to the aid of the stricken country, but there is little they can do. Before the autumn leaves have fallen, the subjugation of Poland is complete. The world now knows it is engaged in a death struggle with the former unemployed house painter, now become world conqueror. The screeching fanatic is familiar. But what about the man? In Bavaria, at Berchtesgarten, the man Hitler has built himself a hideout. It has a patio overlooking the wild mountain known as Untersberg. It is here that he entertains top Nazi officials in private. And it is here that his love for a woman grows and becomes a strange part of this implacable despot's private life. Eva Braun, ex-receptionist in the Photoshop run by Hitler's photographer, Heinrich Hoffmann had begun to appear earlier at Hitler's private receptions at his mountain retreat. Few people knew the strange fascination he has for women. Because of him, three had tried suicide. Eva Braun walked into Hitler's life in the early 30s, but only his intimate friends know of the relationship. While he conferred with party aides, Eva was always in the background at Hitler's retreat, the Berghof. As a very young girl, she had been a, in a woman's institute in Braunau. Hitler took her under his protection in 1932, after she'd tried to kill herself. With Eva came her sister, Gretel. In this beautiful setting, the Polish massacre and the coming war with the Allies seemed remote indeed. A cocktail party atmosphere prevails a great deal of the time. Minor party officials, whose names are lost to history, are there chatting with the Führer, as Eva and her sister and friends provide almost comic relief. And looking at her, one might be inclined almost to pity her. Poor girl, scarcely more than a child, and flattered by the attention of the ruler of her country, she can hardly be expected to act differently. She came from the same humble background as Hitler himself, a possible explanation of his preference for her. The wife of the Führer's adjutant, Frau Schaub, sheds a new light on the love life of Germany's master. There was, after all, Hitler the ladies' man. Das Gerücht, dass Adolf Hitler Frauen gegenüber... She says, those rumors that Adolf Hitler was supposed to be abnormal over women are false. 
As the wife of a man who was his adjutant for 20 years, I had numerous occasions to watch him in private, and also when in the company of ladies. I can assure you that he was definitely a very normal man. He loved women and loved to be in the presence of feminine beauty. I know all about the relationship between him and Eva Braun from 1931 right up to the end. And I also know about many other love affairs. Eva first was seen with Hitler in his house in Munich and then at the Berchtesgaden hideout when that was built. She is seldom photographed with Hitler. She is rarely alone at the Berghof. In addition to Sister Gretel, she has many of her friends who help to provide light-hearted diversion as a balance perhaps for the more serious matters under consideration. They are joined by the wives of Hitler's visitors among the party members. Eva herself enjoys the picture-taking sequences. Perhaps it is the camera that causes the playful mood. Perhaps it is an escape from the frightening decisions being made at these meetings. From top to toe, Eva makes an attractive picture of medium height, blue eyes, round face, framed in darkish blonde hair. We have no comment from Hitler about his sweetheart. From others come varying opinions says Heinrich Hoffmann, who discovered her. She is an ordinary, pretty little shop girl with all the frivolity and vanity of her kind. To Dr. Goebbels, she is that stupid flapper. Knowing how Hitler despises fatness in any form, Eva spends a few hours a day in exercise. Of course, Hitler, whose waking hours are taken up with a thousand duties and obligations, is hardly able to pay her the attention a girl of her years would normally expect. While some of the entries in her diary tell of Hitler's anger and of his neglect and her own mortal unhappiness, she also writes with pride that she is the mistress of Germany's and the world's greatest man. Then she seems not to mind the neglect. In the Berghof, the housekeeper has long been Frau Raubel, who is Hitler's half-sister. It is her job to keep the establishment going so that Tefira may always use it as a spot for quiet business matters away from the chancellery. But after her daughter has shot herself for love of Hitler, she resents Eva's installation as her daughter's successor. In the end, Frau Raubel quits her post, leaving Eva the Chatelaine responsible only to her lord and master in every sense of the word. Over the years, Hitler's bodyguard, the brutal Martin Bormann, turns the Berghof into a second chancellery, which is always awaiting guests. It has seen such notable personalities as Mussolini, Count Ciano, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, others too numerous to mention. This is a reception on the lighter side, however. The chief figure in this group is Herr Professor Goebbels, a frequent visitor to the Berghof. Adolf and Eva pose together for home movies. Then Goebbels and Eva's younger sister, Gretel. Gretel is a more fastidious girl than Eva. In time, she will marry Hitler's aide-de-camp, Hermann Pegelein, and suffer tragedy when he is shot by Bormann as a traitor to Hitler. Hitler's most intimate advisors say they don't know at what point the frivolous Eva becomes his mistress. As the wildfire of the war spreads, Hitler more frequently seeks the companionship of Eva. There has been gossip about Hitler and Eva being the parents of a child, but it seems untrue. This baby is probably the daughter of one of her girlfriends. Here is de Ferrer in a happy mood. Yeah. 
It is hard to imagine now that a great war is raging. Hitler's private guard is ready for a visitor. The only intimation of war comes when someone like Count Ciano, Mussolini's son-in-law, comes to Bastard Garden. Hitler wants to know when Benito is going to keep his promise to come into the war. Several months have gone by and Italy is still neutral. But this serious business does not interfere with the round of gay swimming parties featuring Eva Braun and her friends in a kind of water ballet. The fact that Britain and France are going to make a real effort to cut short the mad career of her lover does not curtail the daily diving practice. The picnic lunches featuring Das Gut Lager Beer. Another episode starring Eva with a supporting cast of Nazi leaders visiting Berchtesgarten. Perhaps the habit of stripping the possessions from enemies of the Reich has caused them to forget their manners. The girls at the Berghof are always willing to provide amusement. These lakeside frolics are some relief from the other business of the Berghof, the planning of world conquest. Still more water sports. It is the era of the rubber raft in the Bavarian lakes near the Berghof, and fun for the visiting leaders of the self-styled master race. Far different from the rubber rafts which are floating in the vast areas of the Atlantic with their human cargoes consigned to the sea by Hitler's roving deadly submarine wolf packs. A graphic report for De Führer. Enemy dead and the plans for further conquest. It is now spring again, April 9th in 1940, and the Nazi planes are in another sky. After a brief show of air might and the march of a few divisions, Denmark and Norway fall before the German army. These tiny countries cannot resist the concentrated might of German arms and take their orders for surrender over the German-controlled radio station. But even Hitler's attempts to remake the map of Europe brings few changes to Berchtesgarten. At Hitler's hideaway, it seems that everything is always the same. The same girls in bathing suits seated on the same blankets, the same water sports, the same carefree air. But not entirely. The beauty of a butterfly's wings are indeed fascinating, as are many things bright and gay. But a butterfly's wings are quite different from those of transport planes. And the transport planes carry a deadly cargo. With blinding swiftness, the chain lightning of the Panzer strikes into Holland. Surrender is almost immediate, then into Belgium. The British are rolled up at Dunkirk. This time, Paris in the spring is a sad Paris. For the second time in a century, German troops march through the Arc de Triomphe. June 22, 1940, in the same railway car in the forest of Compiègne, which witnessed the German humiliation of 1918, the French are forced to sign the unhappy armistice. Among the Germans, there are congratulations all around, and De Fira, really letting himself go for once, almost dances a little jig. After a visit to the Paris Opera House, Hitler goes back to Berchtesgaard. He is spending more and more time in the old familiar haunts now, strolling the paths from the Berghof to the tea house that has been built for him. And Eva is less alone than she has been in earlier years. Under the impact of the tremendous events that rocked the world, Eva is undergoing a change. She senses the role she plays in her lover's drama, and this time, with Julia Stryker as guest, she acts with more dignity. If Adolf seems detached and moody at times, 
and even busier than usual with Joachim von Ribbentrop and Mussolini, it is because there are great things in the air. Everything is pointing to a blow at England, the bases in France and Norway, the air battle over Britain. But Hitler has other plans, known only to his intimate advisors, such as Joseph Goebbels and Heinrich Himmler. June 22nd, 1941. Three great Nazi army groups crash into Russia on a vast front from the Gulf of Finland in the north to the Black Sea on the south. The world is shocked. No one has expected this. Hitler and Stalin have been allies. They have split up Poland. They have signed a mutual assistance pact that drive carries deep into Russian territory. Advance is speeded because the Luftwaffe has absolute control of the air. In the Kremlin, in a slow, halting, colorless voice, Stalin calls upon his people to scorch the earth. But the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, has brought new allies and generals to the Supreme Command. Eisenhower and Bradley join Montgomery and Tedder. Nineteen forty two. American troops invade North Africa. Hitler's Russian invasion has stalled in a great swirling maelstrom of blood and fire whose vortex is Stalingrad. July 10th, 1943, the Allies invade Sicily. Hitler has Mussolini in for a conference. De Vera does not like the way things are going in the South. There is a saying, dictators ride to and fro on tigers, which they dare not dismount. Hitler gives the Italian dictator a severe dressing down. Benito listens, knowing his armies are collapsing. Eva is still kept in the background at the Berghof doing her slimming exercises alone as her fearer struggles with the titanic problems of the war. How can he keep his factories supplying the troops despite mass allied air raids? How to get more work out of slave laborers whose will to work must be created through terror and torture and whose physical energy is being sapped by the lack of food? due to the strain on the German economy. Full production can hardly be expected from starving men who must push and shove each other for the scraps left for them. Their desperate existence is hardly considered by the residents of De Pira's private retreat atop the mountain in Bavaria, Eva and her friends. During this summer of 1943, the Rhine maidens of the Berghof seem little concerned that their world is soon to crumble in the consuming flames of the Allied counterattack. Little Eva and her friends hardly have the capacity for such speculation. Her sister Gretel, heavier now, joins in the enjoyment at one of the crystal streams near the Berghof. The girls like shower baths, the Germans call them brass baths. This falls makes a natural one, cooling on this hot summer's day. But the showers of the German concentration camps are a different kind of shower. In place of the cooling mountain water, their jets carry deadly cyanide gas, showers of death for the unwanted, race extermination. He 
even the clothing will be salvaged. In its death throes, the Third Reich will overlook nothing usable. September the 8th, 1943, under cover of darkness, American and British troops strike across the Strait of Messina and invade Italy. General Mark Clark leads the invasion. Scratch one dictator, Mussolini. German paratroopers rescue him from the prison in which he has been held in protective custody. Brought to Hitler, he thanks his savior profusely. He will live to be hung by his heels in the public square at Milan. British and American bombers are taking off from bases in Britain and North Africa to bomb Germany. In German cities, the fire apparatus is kept constantly busy by the 1,000 plane raids. It is 1944, and the Allies have almost undisputed control of the air. Planes sweep through the skies and rain down destruction on Cologne, Hamburg, Berlin, the Ploiesti oil fields, railroad yards, and rocket launching pads. Never has war visited such havoc on the works of man. Hitler's visions of world conquest are beginning to fade. A battle at Monte Cassino in Italy. Soldiers of many nations are in the bitter fight for the monastery. And they take it and go on to Rome. This is truly an allied army. They understand each other, the universal sign language. The ones who can't understand are the bombed out civilians. They know little about the mad dictator who has caused their plight, especially the children. Along the shell torn roads, they trudge seeking shelter. Now for one of the last glimpses of the Berghof. It's the birthday of the son of one of Eva's friends. And war or no war, a birthday deserves a celebration. But even on a birthday, problems press heavily on a dictator's mind. The ring is closing, but there must be some move, some master stroke. And then the bombings. Day and night, day and night. This is the repayment with interest for Warsaw and Rotterdam and Coventry. Yes, the little fellow gets a birthday party. What will the next one be like? Will there be a next one? June 6, 1944. The French coast from Cherbourg to Le Havre. This is D-Day, 40 Allied Division storm ashore. At Berghof, two months later, Hitler and Nazi officials hold a meeting. A desperate bomb plot has miscarried. Several die in the blast, but Hitler escapes. The only after effect is a slight limp. This war, says Hitler, is one of those elemental conflicts which usher in a new millennium and which shake the world once in a thousand years. This is Schaub, who was then personal aide-de-camp. He says, Adolf Hitler's state of health got a lot worse because of the setbacks on the front, especially after the Battle of Stalingrad. He couldn't sleep, his nerves got worse, and he was forced to take to medicine. But I must kill all those rumors. His brain was perfectly in order, right up to his death. <laughs> Western Front, General George Patton unleashes his tanks. Hitler has worked his revenge for what he considered the humiliation of Germany. He is paying its price. To a desperate Hitler, his blondie is of some comfort. Faithful when even the Fuhrer's life is threatened by his former friends. She is trained to kill on command. On the Russian Front, things go from bad to worse. 
German troops are driven from Romania, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia and Greece. The next Russian move will be into the German heartland. German troops bravely face the massive Russian attacks with the inevitable results when troops are outmanned and outgunned and hungry and cold. You never see a ghost step in the snow. Disaster follows disaster. The Allies storm across France and double their aerial assaults on Germany itself. German troops are surrendering now by the thousands. The white flags of surrender are fluttering everywhere. The GIs pull down the swastika and run up the stars and stripes. So be it, Hitler tells himself, if the Third Reich must fall, let it be to the Americans. But even this is not to be. There has been a deal at Yalta. The British and Americans are to draw up along the Elbe and let the Russians take Berlin. Hitler sees the handwriting on the wall. He must go to Berlin to turn the route into victory or fall in the attempt. And so he and Eva Braun go there and install themselves in the chancellery. There he screams for greater sacrifices. A city in its death throes. All day and all night the guns thunder. Civilians decide to make a run for better cover. so you take chances. April 20th, 1945, and the Russians are mopping up in the Berlin suburbs. Hitler has called in his staff, the final meeting. Should they fly to the south, Hitler elects to stay until the end and goes to a bunker under the chancellery with Eva. Himmler and Goering desert. The crashing gunfire is the sound of approaching doom. On April 22nd, Hitler is in a state of nervous collapse. He refuses to leave the bunker. Julius Schaub remembers the scene. He says, I entered his bedroom in the bunker with him. On the table, there was a 7.5 pistol. He went up to it. I got a terrible shot. He cocked the gun. But no, it wasn't the last hour yet. He was only making sure it was loaded. A few days later, the event took place, which I thought was going to happen at that moment. Defenders of Berlin are routed out. Poison capsules are distributed to the inmates of the vault and the chancellery. On April 29th, Hitler marries Eva Braun. Adolf Hitler's personal pilot, Hans Bauer, tells about Hitler's final orders. He says, 
Approximately one half to three quarters of an hour before Hitler's death on the 30th of April, he sent for me. When I reported, he took both my hands in his and said to me, Bauer, I want to say goodbye. For a moment, I was speechless, and it took 20 minutes to say goodbye. And the other things, he said, Bauer, I have two more orders for you. The first is, I make you personally responsible for burning the corpses of my wife and me. The second is, see to it that Bormann gets through to Dernitz. Dernitz will become my natural successor. I have given Bormann large numbers of orders and documents to take with him to Dernitz. All the time I was struck by Hitler's clear way of speaking. I couldn't believe that this was to be the finish. Flaming Nazi capital is taken. The last defenders are hauled from their holes. Amid the complete ruin, it is difficult to find out what happened to the fallen Nazi idol, but the full story is pieced together later. In the basement of the chancellery, Adolf Hitler shoots and kills himself. Eva takes poison and dies. Their bodies are burned by Joseph Goebbels and Hitler bodyguard Martin Bormann and tossed into this ditch in the courtyard outside their death chamber. Here is Eric Kempka, Hitler's personal chauffeur for many years. He soaked the bodies in gasoline. He says, when I saw the chief for the last time, I definitely had the feeling that the end was near. But there was no change in him that you could see, not in his character nor anything else. He said goodbye and dismissed me. Next day, when the chief was dead, I went on to the bunker just as they were carrying out the corpse. Then came Martin Bormann with Eva Braun in his arms. I took her body away from him and carried her along behind Adolf Hitler. We placed these two bodies side by side in the garden. I had placed on me the exceptionally difficult moral duty of pouring petrol on them and setting fire to them. The corpses burned from half past one until half past seven in the evening. Joseph Goebbels shoots his six children and has an SS guard shoot his wife and himself and the Russians hoist the red flag atop the Brandenburger Gate. American occupation troops arrive from the west, hoist the stars and stripes. Allied leaders, including American generals and Russian generals, take over. The Third Reich dies in a last convulsive catastrophe. The guns crackle sporadically. The Russians are shooting all suspicious persons. Berlin, May 4th, 1945. A city of smoldering ruins, which, like Phoenix, must rise from the ashes of itself. Adolf Hitler has left a mark on his country, which will be remembered for a thousand years. The thousand years he said his Third Reich would endure. Hitler's private mountain lair, Berchtesgarten, shares the fate of Berlin. The scene of his twists with Eva Braun is a shambles. The actors have left the scene forever. The Nazi leaders are dead or in prison. And the female lead, Eva herself, is a rotting corpse, charred beyond recognition. And what shall we say of the principal actor, the part-time common laborer whose dream of leading his people to world conquest ran the gamut of violence, torture, concentration camps, mass death chambers, and ended in utter destruction. In death, as in life, Adolf Hitler remains the sinister symbol of tyranny, the ruthless tyrant whose mad ambition did not stop with the enslavement of his own people, but stopped only after it had unleashed upon the world the most brutal war in recorded history. Quiet has returned to the gay patio at the Berghof, a quiet which, despite the brutal lesson to be learned from the life of Hitler, 
has not yet returned to the world. The horrible specter of man's inhumanity to man still dwells among us.